All right. Mara asks, in IoT, the Internet of Things, it is important to make sure that the things we are connected to are the ones we want to connect. Do you think that blockchain can help in solving IoT security issues? And do you know of any IoT solution using blockchain to enforce security? Uh, honestly, Mauro, I'm quite skeptical when it comes to uh, blockchain being used for security of IoT. I think one of the interesting ideas that we haven't explored is the possibility of using proof of work um, to identify IoT devices that have to do a bit of work to talk to you. But um, in terms of using blockchain to help solve IoT security issues, I'm not quite sure what the benefits are and how it is any different than using a local database. Um, I'm not quite sure what the benefit of putting this information on the blockchain is. There may be some benefits. You may be able to use a public decentralized blockchain in order to log information from IoT devices in a way that maintains that information so that it can be changed in the future. So you effectively use uh, an immutability benefit um, from blockchains. But a lot of people use blockchains, uh, they use the term blockchain to refer to effectively a database that also does digital signatures, that does PKI. I think it is important to understand that the purpose of a blockchain is more than PKI. We have had PKI for 25 years. Um, there is nothing new there. and It is not particularly interesting to take a PKI database and make it public unless you do something with it, like, for example, uh, build a decentralized consensus system so you can have immutability. Uh, and then again, what problem are you solving in that particular case? What are the problems in IoT security that you solve? A lot of people are trying to mash these two terms together, IoT and blockchain, just like they're trying to mash other terms together and take X plus blockchain and pretend that this is something new that X couldn't do on its own without blockchain. Um, I'm very skeptical. Uh, also, when it comes to IoT, the security challenges are very, very big. You know, the, the joke in security settings goes, the S in IoT stands for security. Uh, of course, there is no S in IoT, so that tells you a bit about how that's handled. Um, I'm not sure blockchains are the solution here. Tom asks, Regarding solar energy trading on the blockchain, uh, what, would the, what would be the benefit of using a unique ERC-20 token versus just using Ether for buying and selling power? Um, well, that is a great question. Um, I don't know what the benefits might be, other than um, Ether is produced by uh, mining uh, on the Ethereum network, whereas if you have an ERC-20 token that is related to solar energy, perhaps you can um, mine or mint or issue that token in response to people generating energy, so they can earn that token directly when um, producing energy. But again, the only way you can really measure how much energy someone is producing in order to issue them tokens, is to buy and use that energy by someone else. Uh, is someone else buying and using that energy? And in that case, they could really just pay an ether. Um, so again, not all things need tokens. And you shouldn't be suspicious when you see uh, any application that automatically goes to a token. Um, not many things need utility tokens. Um, utility tokens have a number of limitations, so um, a lot of the projects that are selecting to use a token are doing so in order to fundraise um, more so because they need more so than because they need a utility token to operate their application. And this is exactly the right kind of question to ask, Tom. When it comes to alternative uses of the blockchain, we should all be asking. Do you really need a blockchain for this? Which part of open, borderless, mutual, censorship resistant, decentralized uh, are you using from a blockchain? If you're not, if you're, if you don't care that the system is open, borderless, mutual, censorship resistant, decentralized, etc., then you don't need a blockchain. Um, what do you need a token for? 
what part of a token's functions are you using that requires a token? Why do you need a utility token? Why can't you just use Ether? Why can't you just use something else? And the answer when it comes to tokens is, is there something in the operation of the token that requires a smart contract in order to monitor or adjust or control the usage of that token based on some rules that are interesting to that token? And there are some cases where that's the case, absolutely. Um, but those are fairly rare. Um, a lot of the time, the token is just an excuse to fundraise, and you should be very skeptical of those things. This is Yumo from Solar Bitcoin Meetup. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, my question is, recently I've seen the presentation on the YouTube. The killer app in blockchain will be strong market. Will be what? Uh, killer app in blockchain technology will be a strong market, security market, I mean. A securities market, yeah. 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 So Was this one of my videos or just some uh, other? Yeah, some, someone Somebody else. else. Okay, you. very good. So it means that the blockchain technology will dominate strong market uh -huh. in a, in a, in, a, in 10 years like so what do you think about the idea of that um i think it's very specific uh, and i i try not to make specific predictions so the trick about making predictions is being vague either about the outcome or the timeline <laughs> that's how you could be successful it's a bit like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If I make a prediction, I can tell you what will happen, but not when. Or I can tell you when it will happen, but not exactly what. But not both at the same time. Because <laughs> if I say both at the same time, then I'll be wrong 90% of the time, probably. Or maybe not, in 10 years. Um, so could it be... Uh, I think markets are one of the most important applications for blockchains. Blockchains create markets. They create free and open markets for the participants. Blockchains are markets. Blockchains operate as markets. Blockchains operate using markets in order to calibrate various parameters. So, For example, there is a market for mining. There is a market for the difficulty calculation and proof of work. That is a dynamic marketplace where people make decisions every day as to whether they are profitable. There are currency markets within the crypto space. All of these markets exist because of blockchains. So, Markets are a critical application of blockchain technology. Blockchains will create better, more fair, more transparent, more open markets wherever markets are needed. Interestingly enough, that also means in places where markets are needed, but not wanted. So, for example, and I'll say this, and some of you are going to be shocked and upset, drug markets. Why? Because drug markets are markets! Yay! Drug markets are markets. And um, markets require two things in order to happen. Does anybody know what these are? This is like a test now. It's a quiz part of the presentation. Anyone? Supply? Demand. Great. If you have supply and if you have demand, what happens next? A market happens. It doesn't matter if you try to stop it. A market will happen. Right? I could create a market right now by creating supply and someone in this room having demand for what I supply. Markets emerge. Markets are just behavior. That's all they are. They're human behavior. And so markets emerge. They emerge around things we want, equities, and also around things we well, we want them, but we really shouldn't, like drugs or ice cream or <laughs> you know, other things that are bad for us, smoking, cigarettes, whatever. So markets emerge. And blockchains will create markets. And the interesting thing about blockchains is they will create open, free, transparent, public, borderless, censorship-resistant markets, even if people want to stop them. Unstoppable markets. And that's going to cause some problems. Now, it's also going to mean that stock markets are eventually going to, in many cases, operate on blockchains. Not all of them. Not forever. How many people have used a fax machine in the last year? Okay, let me rephrase that question. How many of you are Americans? 
yeah, I still had to use a fax machine last year. Uh, this is uh, 35 years into the development of the internet. Fax machines still exist, and I had to use a fax machine. Okay, I'm lying. I didn't use a fax machine. I used a website where I uploaded a PDF, and they had a fax machine that sent it to the government agency that insisted on receiving a fax from me. So I basically cheated and sent them a PDF over somebody else's fax. Um, but the point is, no technology ever goes away. I'm sure there's a park somewhere in Seoul where if you really, really want to, you can go for a ride on a horse. Right? Not because you need to, but because they're still around. So the idea that all stock markets are going to be blockchains and there won't be other types of stock markets that will still exist, that's ridiculous. It won't be. We're still going to have the markets that you see today. We're still going to have tuna markets like they have in Japan, where people are bidding on the floor for an actual piece of tuna. These still exist. Tradition is powerful. Um, but I think stock markets are one of the applications that we're going to see sooner rather than later. And the reason is very simple. Um, if you can make a more efficient, more transparent, open public system, then a lot of money can be made with that. So I think it's likely. It's not very interesting to me. It's not the most interesting application of blockchains. Marcel asks, what do you think about blockchain for transport and logistic projects, such as those being done by IBM and Maersk? Um, and can we track items from, say, farm to supermarket? And what are the challenges that need to be addressed? What is the point of using permissioned ledgers or permissioned blockchains for doing supply chain? So this is something that we've heard a lot about. There's a number of companies, mostly IBM, leading uh, in terms of logistics and using permission ledgers to do logistics. Um, I'm not convinced yet of the viability of these projects because I'm not quite sure what problem they're solving. I think the primary idea here is to use a blockchain in order to have a common standard and common implementation of a database between multiple partners who have competing interests. And so in that case, you have a permission ledger that's federated where you have uh, various participants in the logistics and supply chain being able to um, control uh, the security and validation of entries in that supply chain. Is this better than simply having a centralized uh, facility that has a database? It's better in terms of it's less centralized, it's more decentralized, you have a federated group of people. It doesn't provide immutability in the way that an open public blockchain would. And there's the fundamental problem of trying to reconcile what exists in the real world versus what exists on the blockchain. One of the reasons that uh, cryptocurrencies, for example, are secure is because the values of how much Bitcoin or Ether or Monero you own are controlled by the consensus rules. Um, but if somebody um, writes an entry to the blockchain that says a hundred eggs left the factory today, <laughs> there's no way for the consensus rules to validate whether in fact a hundred eggs left the factory. Um, the eggs don't live on the blockchain. And so um, you have to rely on trusting the party that entered that information or a series of other parties that are doing some kind of audit or oversight to validate that information. So it's a very different security model than the security model of an open public blockchain. Does that have a good application? Does it solve real problems in the logistics industry? Um, does it create a novel and disruptive use case for blockchains that is better than a replicated database with digital signatures? Um, it's hard to answer those questions. We'll have to we'll have to see and see whether um, IBM is able to make something of this. Um, I'm very skeptical of these types of projects, um, and so far they haven't really delivered much in terms of utility. But 
we never know, right? We'll see how it goes. Eisen asks, what do you think of using blockchain for securing vehicular communications? The question I would ask for any of these, what do you think of doing X with blockchain, is which component of an open public blockchain, which feature or capability of an open public blockchain are you using? And remember, a blockchain is not a PKI. This is not a digital signature technology. We already have PKI, we already have digital signatures. Blockchains give you decentralization that enable open, public, neutral, censorship resistant, and borderless operation between parties that don't trust each other. So, which part of that solves a problem in vehicular communication? Maybe simply by providing an open public standard that everybody can use that is independent of the car company. But the only way you would get any benefit out of that is if it was a completely open ledger that was public, um, not a private ledger. If it's a private ledger, then it's very difficult to see what benefits would accrue from using such a complicated technology to communicate between vehicles. There is much easier and simpler technologies. Traditional cryptography, digital signatures, message integrity with hashes and fingerprints, that can be used. These are all parts of a blockchain, but they're not a blockchain. These were things that were invented long before blockchains. And so not everything needs a blockchain. And just because something can use digital signatures, hashes, um, or PKI, um, does that mean it needs a blockchain? Are there any convincing examples of identity management on blockchains that you know of? Um, identity is a very difficult problem to solve, and the problem has a lot to do with everything other than blockchains. Um, again, I'm not convinced that there are uh, solutions, especially today, for doing identity on blockchains. Um, the primary problem is that you can't verify the identity of someone using the consensus um, algorithm within a blockchain. So, if you're not verifying that, then Someone has to verify the truth uh, before an identity is uh, recorded. Depending on how you do that, you either end up with effectively a centralized database that maybe exists with an open standard but, um, and is accessible by everyone, but um, is controlled in terms of what data is on it by a single entity. This is the same problem that people are trying to solve with oracles in Ethereum, which is, how do you trust this third party, this oracle of identity, um, that the information is, is correct? And if you compromise the mechanism by which the information is recorded on the blockchain, then the blockchain uh, records, in potentially an immutable fashion, a lie that cannot be validated by consensus, and that is propagated to everyone who uses it. So, you haven't really gained anything. Again, which part of open, borderless, censorship resistant, neutral, and decentralized do you gain by adding a blockchain to the problem of identity management? It's not a database for PKI. There are some potential advantages to permissioned ledgers if those permission ledgers create a common standard that requires less trust in a centralized party for the collaboration of a few federated members um, of a consortium or competitors within an industry. There may be some advantages to that, uh, essentially more as an open source, open standard mechanism for coordinating information across parties that don't trust each other. But again, um, Tying things that are not part of the blockchain, doing things that are not intrinsic to the blockchain, like cryptocurrencies, um, and trying to control, assess, verify stuff that is not on the blockchain, people, products, logistics, uh, votes, etc., that happen in the real world, uh, requires you to trust whoever puts that information into the blockchain which simply moves the problem one step away from the consensus algorithm. And again, you have to have 
some reason for doing that. Um, otherwise, what you end up with is a database that has a better pitch deck for venture capitalists because it has the word blockchain but doesn't actually have any real use case for blockchain. My name is Jeff McDonald. I'm the co-founder of the NIM Foundation. Hi, Jeff. I, I, first of all, sincerely want to thank you for your service in making the world a better place. Thank you. It, it, you've done a great job. I've never heard someone call it service, but okay. It is. It is. You, you, you. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. No, seriously. Um, uh, do you believe that Bitcoin has a place to someday offer an open, borderless, censorship resistant um, form of identity? Uh, so identity is very, very tricky um, because identity isn't a singular thing. Identity is a fractal. It's a multi-dimensional fractal that, um, depending on which aspect of human identity you look at, you can separate one aspect of it, and then if you look at it very closely, you notice that it's actually composed of other smaller aspects of identity. And if you look at each one of those, they're composed of other smaller, and and all the way down to infinity, right? So um, identity in itself is a very, very tricky thing. Also, identity is not a thing. It's a social construct, very much like money, but with some very important nuances. Um, so I think it's premature to be dealing with identity right now, and I think that a lot of the projects that are attempting to deal with identity today are dangerous. Part of the reason they're dangerous is because they're applying a very mechanistic view of human behavior, meaning if you do X today, then you are 66.3% likely to do Y tomorrow. When you apply that to humans, it creates a very difficult situation. One, the machines never forget, which means that every mistake you make between the ages of 11 and 15 will follow you for the rest of your life. So, What did you do that was really stupid before you were 15? Everything. Everything. Uh, so did I. Right? I do not want to even think about the things I did before I was 15 years old. Um, many of which could have landed me in jail, um, and uh, certainly none of which I would want people to be reading at my funeral. You know, like. And then on December third, nineteen eighty-six, look at what Andreas did. <laughs> no, no, please forget about that. Forgetting is a very important part of the social compact. Without forgetting, society creates a situation where there is no forgiveness. And without forgiveness, you remove the possibility of change from people. Right? Because if you assume that people uh, don't change, then you create an environment where people can't change. And we have a word for that. It's called fascism. And I don't want that kind of situation. So machine identity is dangerous. It's not unsolvable. It's not impossible to find useful applications. It's just that we have to be very careful. I'm a strong believer that when you're operating in the domain of technology, as technologists, we have a very important obligation to study, understand, and consider ethics in the work we do. Without ethics, technology is dangerous. Right? And when it comes to identity or any other social construct which is about human behavior, ethics becomes very important to consider. Because these technologies will, if you allow them, start changing the way society works, start changing the way humans work, and have deep reaching implications. There are some experiments going on at the moment in China with a system called Sesame, which is a social credit score that, according to recent reports, has now prevented 26 million people from traveling using public transportation because their political and social behavior has earned them a low enough score that they've been banned. That's dangerous, right? And it's only getting worse. So um, those are the kinds of things that we don't want to do with technology. Shabib asks, how can you see blockchain be used for voting and election processes? Um, Shabib, I think it's still very early for implementation of voting or election processes using blockchain technology. And there's a number of reasons why it's too early. One of them is that this technology is still uh, early stage, it's poorly understood, and not many people have access to this technology. 
it's already a problem in many um, developed economies that voting is done with electronic machines that most people don't know how to operate and that are inscrutable and can't be audited properly. Uh, that creates more opportunities for voting fraud within the election as well as uh, lost votes. And we see this happening uh, quite a lot in uh, developed economies even. In order to use blockchain for voting and election processes, you have to think about a couple of different things. First of all, um, would a blockchain that is being used for elections be decentralized? Um, and if it's not decentralized, uh, what are the benefits of using a blockchain versus a simple database? Um, one of the advantages is perhaps the ability to inspect and audit digital signatures. But the problem with that is that it makes it very difficult to maintain the privacy anonymity of your vote. Um, if it is decentralized, which platform do you run it on? And which government would trust a decentralized blockchain to run its elections on? Again, hard to see at this point in time. And um, Finally, you know, the, the general idea of moving voting to more digital systems uh, causes problems, especially in countries where not many people have access to this technology. I think what we're going to see is voting and election processes used for uh, smaller organizational units, not national elections, but instead perhaps a shareholder election within a company or voting for decisions in the governance of a decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO, um, or in uh, some smart contract voting on a very specific topic. I think we're going to see a lot of that happening more and more, and gradually we're going to see those types of voting techniques being used for larger and larger organizational entities as people build confidence that the system can be neutral and deliver some benefits over traditional voting systems. Uh, maybe sometime in the very, very far future, we'll see that being implemented for uh, national elections. Mahmoud asks, we have lots of tokens, most of which are just white papers and not yet fully executed. When do you think these ideas can reach the implementation stage? You know, honestly, Mahmoud, many of them will never reach the implementation stage. Um, we have to start thinking differently in this new world of tokens where everyone can create a token. Um, we have to think differently about the value and use cases around these tokens. It's a bit like asking, everybody has a blog. When are these blogs going to be, uh, start doing serious journalism? Uh, well, not all blogs are going to be doing serious journalism. And so uh, just because everybody can create a blog, everybody's created a blog and many of them are bad. Just because everybody can create a token, everybody has created a token and many of them are just white papers and a ERC20 implementation and nothing more. So um, don't expect any of these things to develop in any way other than just the original idea. Um, Ideas are cheap. Uh, being able to produce new ideas is uh, something the people who understand the space um, and are thinking about these problems can generate 10 ideas a day. The real uh, catch comes when people try to execute on these ideas and turn these ideas into real products uh, or services. And of course, that's where things get more difficult. So, if somebody comes to you and say, they, I have a fantastic idea for uh, something new in the blockchain space, that idea is worth nothing. And these white papers are worth nothing um, without any kind of implementation behind them. And that's okay. You, know, you, you have to accept that in a space where anybody can create something uh, very cheap or for free, then you don't really need to consider what they've created seriously.